Good afternoon and welcome to today's Jewish Policy Center webinar with guest David Schenker of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the JPC and your host. We are now headed into the third year of webinar programming and I'm really pleased to see the sign up list growing, but also more important to see how many of you are coming back for a second or third or a 17th program. I know I'm learning a lot. I hope you are as well. Our subject today is wars to Israel South, threats in the Persian Gulf and Red Sea. We may look a little bit off topic given the Russian invasion of Ukraine last night, but actually uh, we're not. We were ahead of the curve. We have had on this program, uh, Professor Stephen Blank, formerly of the US Army War College, talk about how Vladimir Putin sees this situation, not only in Ukraine, but with NATO, with Europe, and with the United States. If you missed that program, please go to our website, jewishpolicycenter.org, and download it. Uh, Professor Blank was right on target. We'll get back to Ukraine, I suspect, when things are clarified a little bit. Uh, we're staying on it. But at the same time, it's never a good idea to stop looking at Iran and the mess that Iran is making in the Middle East. So before we get to David Schenker, one of the smartest people I know, let me give you the JPC commercial. We were founded as a 501c3 nonprofit organization in 1985, for providing analysis of foreign and domestic policy by scholars, academics, and commentators. JPC supports a strong American defense capability, US-Israel security cooperation, and missile defense. We support the legitimacy and security of Israel against anyone who would deny them. As an organization that sits slightly to the right of center, not too much, just slightly, we advocate for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, and energy security, as well as free speech and intellectual diversity. In this series of programs, we have brought you a lot of really outstanding speakers. Richard Goldberg on Iran sanctions, more than once. Award-winning journalist Claudia Rosette on human rights or the lack thereof in China. Dan Blumenthal on a variety of subjects related to China. Brigadier General Asaf Orion of the IDF on US-Israel security relationship and the changes that each country has undergone in its relations with China. Scholar of Islam Harold Rode has talked about the Turkish determination to Islamize Jerusalem. We've had Ilya Shapiro, Doug Fife, Michael Duran, Arsene Ostrovsky, Max Abrams, and more. And today I'm thrilled to bring you David Schenker, who has served as Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, where he was Principal Middle East Advisor to the Secretary of State and the senior official overseeing the conduct of US policy and diplomacy in a region that stretches across 18 countries, from Morocco through Yemen to Iran, the Palestinian Authority, and his bio says the Western Sahara, but I don't think it exists anymore. So maybe we have to get rid of the Western Sahara. Through diplomacy and America, that's right. Through diplomacy and the effective use of resources and assistance, as well as through sanctions, David worked to promote human rights, deter terrorism, fight corruption, uh, and push back against regional adversaries. In addition to developing and implementing the U.S. strategy on China in the region, and I'm going to ask him about that, he um, worked to resolve the conflicts in Libya and Yemen, consolidate the Abraham Accords, and counter the malign. Uh, influence of Iran in the region. That was his second stint in government. From 2002 to 2006, he was in the Office of the Secretary of Defense as Levant Country Director, the Pentagon's top policy aide on the Arab nations of the Levant. There he advised the Secretary and other senior Pentagon leadership on the military and political affairs of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and the Palestinian territories. He was awarded the Defense the Office of the Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Civilian Service in 2005. David has now returned to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he is the Taubi Senior Fellow and Director of the Program on Arab Politics. His writings about Jordan, Lebanon, Hezbollah, Egypt, and the Gulf have appeared everywhere you think they should. If I listed them, we would be here all day. So we are pleased to have him with us. David, the floor is yours. Well, um... Thank you so much, Shoshana, and it's a pleasure to be with the Jewish Policy Center uh, once again. 
Um, you had asked me to talk about Persian Gulf and the Red Sea and the wars to Israel South, which is what I'll be addressing today. Of course, all of our thoughts are with the developments in the, in the Ukraine. So uh, thank you, whoever's ever out there, uh, for, uh, for taking the time out today. I know it's, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, I've got a, a, a PowerPoint uh, that I'm going to use today because I think it's um, a lot better to look at maps than at me. Um, so I'm going to uh, see if I can, can load that up. And uh, Shoshana, please let me know if this is coming up properly. Up, okay, it's up. great. Great. Thank you. So I want to start off with a, a general map here of what we're looking at. Um, We've got uh, on this side, we're talking about the Red Sea, the Babel Mandeb here in the circle. Um, and this is Yemen down here. I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, yes, we can. But uh, this is Yemen and uh, this is where um, the Houthis are based, which is uh, one of several uh, Iranian backed proxy uh, and according to some people, uh, terrorist organizations um, that are operating in, uh, in the Arab Middle East, uh, um, among others. So you have in, in, uh, in Iraq, the Hashid, the uh, popular mobilization um, units. You have uh, Hezbollah, of course, in Lebanon, and also um, uh, Fatim Yun, uh, which are also Iranian-backed um, Afghan proxies who've been operating in Syria. Um, uh, and anyway, once again, Babel Mandeb here. Um, on the other side, um, we've got Iran and the Persian Gulf in the state, streets of uh, here. Um, and uh, we've got Saudi Arabia and Oman, uh, Iraq. Uh, this is a set, the, the second uh, choke point um, that is so critical. Um, you have something like 6 million uh, barrels of oil um, passing through the Red Sea, going through the, the Suez Canal per day. Um, and untold amounts, um, I don't have the numbers, going uh, through uh, these straits, um, uh, passing from the, from the Persian Gulf. Um, and uh, so, of course, these are strategic areas, uh, notwithstanding efforts to, um, uh, to diversify energy supplies. These are still critical to global commerce, obviously. Um, this is a, the broader map looking at the, the two choke points. Um, but the main point here is obviously you've got Iran uh, and an Iranian proxy uh, that is basically on the verge of taking over entirely Yemen uh, that control the two leading um, transit points for the energy supply of the world. Um, and that's a, uh, a dangerous matter. I want to say a, a little something about uh, the the Houthis. Uh, who are the Houthis? Um, and this is uh, once again the proxy organization of Iran that is um, poised to take over um, take over Yemen. Uh, the Houthis are not um, they're nominally Shiite, but they're not uh, not exactly. They're Zaidi Muslims. Uh, they're a relig religious minority in Yemen. Their, their name comes from Zayd bin Ali, the grandson of, of Ali, who, who was Muhammad's fourth, uh, Muhammad's cousin and the fourth caliph um, in the, the initial days of the founding of Islam. They do not, uh, like the theocracy in Tehran, believe in Bilayat Faqih, that is um, uh, the uh, supremacy of the Ayatollah um, uh, as being the marja'iyah, the source of, of religious authority. Um, so uh, I've got a timeline of the Civil War, but going back before that, um, at the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in, in 1918, a Zaidi monarch took, took power in North Yemen. Um, in 1962, you had an Egyptian-backed coup. This is uh, the Nasser days that overthrew the Zaidi king and replaced them with an Arab nationalist government with its capital in Sana. Um, Zaidi royalists backed by the Saudis fought a civil war for control of the country. Um, during that war, Egypt lost something like 45,000 troops. It's known as Egypt's Vietnam. They also used chemical weapons during that campaign. Um, the Egyptians ultimately gave up 
an afford a former officer, a general named Ali Abdullah Saleh, um, who was a Zaidi Republican uh, military officer, came to power in 1978 after a series of coups. Um, the Zaidis eventually came to oppose uh, Saleh, um, who ruled or, or, or perhaps better said misruled for some 30 years. Um, and with the Arab Spring, um, uh, went to uh, went to war and a popular uprising against him. Um, Saleh um, stepped down and, uh, and there's a political transition plan by Arab states. This guy, Abdul Rabu Mansour Hadi, uh, became the interim president. Um, but the Houthis continued their advance. They uh, sacked Sana, they drove Hadi um, out. He fled initially to Yemen. Now he lives in a palace in Saudi Arabia. Um, in 2015, the Saudis said enough of this um, and put together a coalition to push back on the Houthis who were um, allied with Iran. Um, the Houthis started getting uh, major deliveries of weapons, advanced technology, uh, the Saudis, uh, the, uh, the Emirates uh, banded together with some assistance from Jordan, some other um, Arab partners playing minor roles, tried to roll back the, the Houthis. Um, they took control of Hudayda port, which is, um, if we go back, um, Hudayda port is right about here on the coast of Yemen. Um, uh, which is the leading point of the basically the leading port um, uh, in in the north of the country um, to try and prevent uh, weapon shipments going through Hudaydah to the Houthis, um, but this lasted in a, a stalemate. They couldn't um, uh, they couldn't really take Hudaydah. They took Hudaydah. They controlled entry of uh, of goods, but you got a stalemate. Um, and of course, uh, as you as you probably have heard. Um, the Saudis, as they were pursuing uh, this campaign, um, uh, mostly through proxies on the ground, allies on the ground, and, uh, and Saudi air power, uh, there was an enormous uh, amount of um, uh, collateral civilian casualties. Um, and uh, the international community basically turned against the Saudis here and pushed the Saudis to sue for peace. In 2019, uh, the, the Emirates unilaterally withdrew from, from uh, their forces from the campaign, um, and, uh, and the Houthis pressed forward. They launched uh, an offensive that took um, a year and a half or two years uh, to capture Marib, which is right here uh, on the map. So they're moving out from Houthi-controlled territory, um, going to take Marib, which is a leading um, uh, oil producing site in Yemen, um, and from there um, attempted to move on to, to Shabwa, which has uh, also enormous amount of oil um, infrastructure. Um, the, uh, the, the Houthis employed uh, child soldiers, they lost thousands, they went on for about a year. Um, even before this, the Saudis were um, I think in good faith, looking for a negotiated solution to the war starting in about 2020. Um, the Houthis um, saw that with um, Iranian support that they could win the war militarily. They didn't have to have a negotiated solution. They pressed on. Uh, it looked like they were gonna take Marib. This is about five, six months ago. Um, and uh, after they, took Marib, they started to move toward Shabwa and the United Arab Emirates most recently got uh, involved in the war again. Uh, they have uh, their own locally backed forces on the ground uh, that they strengthened and they pushed the Houthis back uh, to Marib and, and beyond. Anyway, we have a stalemate. We have, don't have a negotiated solution, but you do have the Houthis essentially controlling the entire coast and uh, the Baba Mandeb Strait, um, which, you know, as I said earlier, poses a, um, a huge problem for um, potentially for international shipping. And we'll talk a little bit more about why and how um, uh, in the Red Sea. Um, the Houthis' motto um, is Allahu Akbar, God, Allah is the greatest, death to the United States, death to Israel, curse on the Jews, and victory to Islam. Um, Beyond wanting Yemen, uh, the Houthis also talk 
about broader regional um, territorial ambitions. Among them, uh, conquering Mecca and Medina and, uh, and taking Jerusalem. So this is not just a, a local organization with limited uh, regional aspirations. This is an organization uh, that is somewhat millenarian um, and has uh, grandiose views of what it can and will ultimately accomplish. Now, um, you know, we can talk about whether they were predisposed to an alliance um, with Iran, um, you know, uh, I'd say not necessarily, uh, but over time they recognized uh, the uh, strategic benefit of doing so, the advanced weaponry, uh, financial support, um, smuggling, uh, the shared common enemy of the Saudis, um, and have over time gotten closer to uh, Iran. So now you have Houthis uh, in Yemen who are sending their kids to a religious school in Iran. And this is over time, if you look at the, the, uh, the Lebanon model, this is how it works, right? They establish uh, ties, educational ties, cultural ties, military ties, financial ties. And over time, um, uh, the Shiites of Lebanon, for example, um, many of them, and Hezbollah uh, promoting it, um, switched their religious source of reference from um, uh, either Sistani in Iraq or Fadlallah in Lebanon to Tehran. And this is ultimately what Iran's goal is to gain this sort of religious uh, legitimacy and preeminence, um, which uh, helps them in their hegemonic regional ambitions. So there's the timeline of the civil war. I'm going the wrong way. Um, so what is, what do the Houthis get? Um, I don't know if you can notice here, there's a picture of me uh, back when I was assistant secretary uh, taking a tour. Actually, this is uh, Tim Lenderkin, um, who is an uh, excellent diplomat, who is now the, the Biden administration's envoy uh, for Yemen. Um, he was uh, accompanying me on a trip to, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and here we're just, on a, a military base um, looking at captured or shot down um, Houthi uh, military equipment. Um, because during the war, while uh, certainly um, Saudi Arabia has uh, much more advanced capabilities uh, than, the, than the Houthis, um, the Houthis not only um, get these drones and missiles, rockets from Saudi Arabia, from, uh, from Iran, um, but they've also um, uh, have um, developed an indigenous capability to produce this kind of equipment. And what we're looking at here is a suicide drone or a kamikaze drone. Um, and these are the, the type of missiles provided. Um, and we, we see from, from the seizures as well, um, which we'll get to, um, we seized in December 2021 um, 171 surface-to-air missiles, eight anti-tank missiles, and over 1.1 million barrels of petro petroleum products from Iran that were on a boat um, destined for, uh, for the Houthis. Uh, we've done a number of um, at-sea boardings uh, in 2019 and 2021 as well. Um, in 2021, the Navy announced that it had seized 1,400 AK-47s, uh, 225,000 rounds of ammunition. Um, so Iran is, according to uh, the, the Pentagon, increasing the, the lethality and complex, uh, complexity of both the equipment and the knowledge that it's transferring to the Houthis, which is alarming because there is a UN arms embargo on Yemen, um, but it's not being enforced. But just say that someday it was enforced, you still have an indigenous capability of the Houthis. Here's uh, another picture from that trip with um, a Scud missile that the, uh, the Houthis had fired into, um, into Saudi Arabia. And you see this um, uh, with some frequency, and we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. Um, but uh, this has become uh, a major problem. And it's not only um, the aerial uh, capability, 
um, that we're seeing here, the drones and the missiles. But the, the Houthis have also, and uh, at this museum, I don't have any pictures here, but at this um, exhibit that, uh, that the Saudis take US and, and uh, European international officials to, um, at this museum, they also have examples of drone ships. So the Saudis have provided, uh, sorry, the Iranians have provided to the, the Houthis uh, drone ships, which are also explosive laden ships uh, that are remotely piloted, um, one of which um, hit um, a Saudi military vessel um, in the Red Sea. Um, uh, and uh, obviously uh, this provides some sort of plausible deniability to the Houthis, but the United States uh, is on record, the Department of Defense, that the Houthis are clearly responsible for this. Um, more, re more recently, in January uh, of this year, the Houthis seized a, an Emirati vessel in the Red Sea, which they claimed was carrying military supplies that the UAE denies us. Um, the United States government referred to the vessel as a merchant vessel, um, but they've attacked Emirati vessels in the Red Sea and Bab al-Mandeb Strait throughout the, throughout the war. In 2016, they attacked a, a boat under the UAE's military command in Bab al-Mandeb Strait. Um, they attacked a boat, uh, an Emirati ship, docking at uh, al Maka port in 2017, and hit uh, a UAE ship off the coast of Hodeida in 2018. Um, you know, they are developing in, beyond these sort of drone ships um, what uh, some people describe as sophisticated coastal defense and sea denial capabilities, including the use of anti-shipping missiles, mines, and, uh, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, these uh, drone boats. Um, they, in, in, since 2005, the Houthis have, have fired projectiles that have, have struck ships. And in mid-2018, uh, they attacked a Saudi oil tanker, um, which led the kingdom to temporarily halt its shipments in the Red Sea. So this is serious business, very disruptive, um, and uh, is a high level of capability that has implications for not only the safety, security, economic well-being of, of our, our global partners, um, but for, for global commerce. Here's a picture of the, well, one of the sea shipments um, that, uh, that they, typically the United States lays these out and uh, after they're captured to let people get a look at them, but you can see the um, the, the nature of, um, of what, what they're getting there. Um, for AKs. So <clears throat> they've been very active as well um, in going after uh, targets um, in Saudi Arabia. Now, um, yeah, this, the, the Aramco attack um, here was actually uh, an Iranian attack, but uh, the Houthis initially claimed credit for the attack, probably uh, one could only imagine at the behest of their, their Iranian um, uh, patrons. But um, they have been firing um, advanced drones and missiles into Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, ballistic missiles, um, armed drones uh, that are, are, are kamikaze and have other capabilities. Um, if, if it means anything, the Iranian made Samad two and three drones, um, who, which are hundreds of, of miles of range, but they also um, you know, have loitering drones as well, which are you know, demonstrate uh, you know, high level of advanced uh, technology. Um, so uh, these are, are weapons that go to the Houthis directly, but also um, go on um, indigenous markets um, in, uh, in Yemen. Now, we have um, reacted to this um, at times um, by uh, doing two things. One is um, we flowed uh, forces uh, weapons uh, into Saudi Arabia, also missile defense. These are Patriot batteries that we stationed, operated at the Prince Sultan Air Base. Uh, but the United States government also, and you can see over time, 
um, a dramatic improvement of Saudi ability to defend themselves. So um, we have helped them over time to integrate um, their anti-missile uh, uh, anti systems. Um, they have developed on their own um, counter drone um, uh, protocols where they use F-15 fighters to shoot down drones um, that are slower moving uh, than these ballistic missiles. But um, if you look at uh, their record over the last year and a half or so, um, the Saudis have gained I think, uh, an impressive uh, uh, proficiency uh, at defending themselves. And so um, when the Biden administration initially uh, tried to, or said they were gonna deny um, the Saudis certain types of weapons because of human rights issues, um, they continued to provide um, uh, air-to-air uh, equipment, uh, the AMRAMs and things of the sort, um, so that Saudis can shoot these down. But um, there is, um, just from an economics point of view, um, you know, the, the Houthis are shooting, um, you know, a couple thousand dollar drones and missiles um, at Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia is spending a million dollars to shoot down a missile with a you know five thousand dollar missile with a with a Patriot. Um, so it's a very costly endeavor, uh, but uh, overall they've been a lot more successful. But that doesn't mean that they've um, that they've been perfect. Um, so one of the things that the Houthis do um, is they target airports, civilian airports. So this is from from Abha. If it is on airport as well, these are two major airports in the south of Saudi Arabia. And um, there are civilians at these airports because they are commercial airports. And um, as you might know, there are something like 100,000 Americans who live in Saudi Arabia. And sooner or later, the Houthis will undoubtedly uh, and regrettably kill an American um, or uh, certainly um, some, uh, some other um, nationalities, uh, as we saw that they did most recently um, in the UAE. Um, so these things are, are dangerous, and they have come quite close to, to hitting Americans before. Um, you know, one of the reasons why the Trump administration, Secretary Pompeo, in the waning days of, of the, uh, the Trump administration, decided to designate the Houthis um, you know, there was a real argument um, or debate about this. Um, and it was primarily driven by um, humanitarian concerns. So we would have the WH, uh, the, um, the, um, the World Food Organization um, come to us, David Beasley, who's just a, a very impressive uh, leader of the organization, would come to us and say, you can't do this. You can't designate um, the Houthis because it will have a chilling effect on um, uh, financing for, uh, for food products on humanitarian organizations that do work um, in Yemen that, um, that uh, the, you know, financing will stop, that already something like 70% of Yemenis depend on international organizations for their daily sustenance, um, and that a designation would um, prompt a famine. And um, I had written, you know, I'd spoken to the secretary many times about this and provided him with a, with a memo uh, about this. And the secretary said, hey, I'll let you know after Christmas. And I uh, came into work one day and uh, I was getting my morning intel briefing and it was already in the news in any event that the Houthis had shot a missile at Aden Airport um, just as uh, the new Yemeni government was arriving in Aden. <clears throat> and it was a, a blatant attempt to basically kill every member of the new Yemeni government. And I said to my intelligence brief for that morning, I said, well, I, th I think I know the secretary has made up his mind. And of, of course, later that day, he said, well, we're going to pull the trigger on this. And he designated the Houthis. And um, of course, this was um, the first thing, the uh, first foreign policy act the Biden administration engaged in, which was to lift or, or delist the Houthis as a terrorist organization. I don't, I don't think any of us 
uh, I don't think there's any debate about whether the Houthis, um, through the legal definition of a terrorist organization, according to the US government, whether they fit the bill. They are a terrorist organization, but they were taking off for political or humanitarian reasons, or perhaps to provide uh, um, a, a more an environment more conducive to successful peace negotiations in the war. Um, well, I think that's a similar strategy taken by the Biden administration on uh, lifting any number of sanctions against Iran to sweeten the deal and improve the the environment for getting back into the JCPOA, but I, I digress. Um, it didn't work. Um, the Houthis um, basically pocketed that and upped the campaign um, against the Saudis. And um, uh, in the slide that I uh, earlier I mentioned about um, how the Houthis had taken uh, Marib and were headed toward Shabwa, which was the energy gateway, I'd written at the time in Foreign Policy Magazine that if, uh, that if there was no pushback from either the Saudi-led coalition um, or uh, US support that the war would be lost. And essentially the Houthis uh, would have won the war. And um, I mentioned that uh, the UAE um, got involved once again, back their, uh, their local allies and helped um, repel um, the Houthi offensive um, toward Shabwa. And in response to that, that's when we saw, by the way, this is just a graphic of where the Houthis have uh, sent drones and missiles in Saudi Arabia over a, uh, you know, over a five year period. It's pretty extensive, obviously. And we can talk about the ranges of their, their missiles as well, but you can see they're hitting up here it's pretty far north. If you look to the left of there, you'll see Israel, right? That's a range that encompasses Israel. But, um, but um, I don't think I have a slide of this. Um, we saw just in January that the Houthis hit the United Arab Emirates, right? Now this had ha this has happened before in July 2018. Uh, the Houthis attacked Abu Dhabi airport with a drone. They nearly hit a plane loaded with passengers on the runway, right? Uh, the, that was reported at the time. Uh, the UAE has denied uh, that report. But, um, it, uh, but since then, since the, um, the Emiratis got involved once again in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in Yemen, in, the, in, the, in Shabwa, um, you've seen uh, three attacks on the Emiratis. You saw a drone and missile attack against a key oil facility that killed three, uh, I think it's Sri Lankan and, and a couple Indian uh, nationals um, on January 24th. Um, there was another attack, but it was intercepted and there were no casualties. Um, uh, it, uh, there are reports that uh, one of the, the missiles apparently was targeting uh, Dafra Air Base in Abu Dhabi, where U.S. troops are stationed. Um, and then, of course, uh, there was a ballistic uh, missile attack against Abu Dhabi, another one on January 31st that was uh, successfully intercepted. Um, on February 2nd, we had another attack on, on uh, the UAE, uh, but that uh, reportedly came, was fired by an Iraqi militia. So uh, this is highly volatile area. In the aftermath, by the way, of, uh, of uh, the Emirati attacks, uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan um, issued a, a statement, um, actually very similar to the statement that they issued um, on Ukraine back in January of 2021, uh, committing the United States to the security and territorial integrity of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I don't know how the Emirates are feeling about that guarantee right now, but, um, you know, you've seen the tax ebb, ebb and flow, but those are the most recent ones um, on, on the Emirates. And of course, you have the Iranians um, who have been um, scuttling shipping with, uh, with some frequency in the Persian Gulf, right? So moving from the Red Sea um, to the Persian Gulf and the uh, Straits of Hormuz, you have um, uh, you know, uh, a chart here that, that shows over time 
uh, kinetic attacks, diversion of tankers. You had um, maybe four days after I started at the State Department, you had uh, the Iranians scuttle um, a series of, 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 of ships in Fujairah off the coast of, of the Emirates um, with limpet mines. You have had uh, other tankers, including Israeli tankers now that are operating in the, in, in the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman, but you're being targeted. Um, you have you know, ships that are, 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 being, are being hit uh, with some frequency. And uh, of course, the United States has in place something called the, Interna uh, the International uh, Maritime Security Construct, which is basically that um, a, uh, a broad group of, um, of um, European, uh, Persian Gulf countries, um, I think we had some, some Asian uh, countries as well, that basically escort um, tankers through the Gulf because Iran it seeks plausible deniability here. So those ships are not um, armed with uh, with guns, but rather with cameras, and attempt to dissuade the Iranians from launching these kind of attacks um, and uh, disrupting global commerce, which the Iranians do from time to time, looking for leverage. I hinted earlier um, that the range um, of these Iranian uh, uh, UAVs uh, and missiles um, is significant. Uh, and so we've seen uh, any number of times that the IDF has deployed air defenses, including Patriot batteries, um, south to a lot. And uh, you know, you just ask yourself what the threat is. Well, I, Netanyahu said it, uh, the prime minister said it publicly uh, a couple of years back. He said it's the Houthis. Um, so this was done, you know, in, in 21, um, you know, uh, I think on the anniversary of the Soleimani assassination, um, you know, we still have uh, patriots pointing south um, in a lot. Uh, now, there are reports that they've been there in Demona uh, for some time, uh, but uh, I think this is somewhat unusual and points to Israel's perception of the growing threat um, from Yemen um, to Israeli security. So all told, um, once again, I think in, in, uh, in summary, um, you know, the prospect um, of Iran controlling essentially two of the major choke points of global commerce, of, of the, the, the movement of the free flow of, of energy resources um, is incredibly, I think, troubling um, and reason for concern. And I think, and I could be wrong here, but I think that as we're approaching uh, what appears to be um, the administration's reaching a deal with Iran on the renewal of the JCPOA and the release of something like $100 billion in frozen assets um, to Iran, um, I think the situation gets worse because I think um, Iran's proxy organizations, um, which you know, operate on the cheap in any event, um, uh, Iran will be able to provide these groups uh, with a whole lot more largesse. And uh, whether it's the Houthis, whether it's the Hasht, whether it's Hezbollah, um, which has you know, very close links with the, the Houthis. Um, I, think, um, I think we're looking at um, an even more volatile uh, Red Sea and Persian Gulf. So with that, uh, on that optimistic note, I'm gonna end my presentation. Okay, um, <clears throat> I love optimism, David. We have, a, we have some questions and I'm gonna to try to fold them together. Uh, you talked essentially about the evolution of the war. Where did it come from? Where is it now and where does it look like it's going? So there's evolution on the other side also. To a certain extent, one would assume that the evolution of the Abraham Accords is a response of the Gulf Arab countries to, lights go out here, the Gulf Arab countries to 
the threats and wanting Israel to be involved in their defense because Israel brings defensive capabilities. And the other thing that has evolved is the movement of Israel from UCOM to CENTCOM, which I think has the same underlying principle that the people of the CENTCOM region need Israeli capabilities in defending. So first of all, is that where we're going? And secondly, if that's where we're going, there are a lot of countries in the CENTCOM realm that don't have relations with Israel. How do you, how does Israel manage to defend its friends without like, getting close to its enemies? Well, thank you. Those are, are good questions. Uh, so I think there's a lot of potential here for uh, missile defense cooperation, um, for uh, transfer of some technology um, we saw, I think, Benny Gans, an Israeli president, go to Bahrain uh, last week. We've seen visits and closer cooperation with the, with the Emirates. Um, you know, we'll see how far they can go. The Emirates has said publicly at one point uh, that they would not, um, you know, uh, allow an attack, I believe they said, on, on Iran uh, emanating from, from the Emirates. On, whether they would allow stationing of offensive capabilities there. Um, we do know that the US has you know, a base in Dafra, but um, you know, what type of Israeli presence the, there will be, um, I think that remains to be seen, but the potential that uh, there will be Iron Dome or Iron Sling, I think right now it, it's hard to see that in the near future because Israel itself doesn't have sufficient capability for its own threats. Um, um, while CENTCOM, I think, can provide sort of a nice umbrella, um, you know, and the Israel has, you know, a working relationship with Oman on a number of issues, you know, uh, including this medric, they do water cooperation um, and have had quiet contacts for a number of years. You know, I don't see um, uh, Oman and, and, uh, and Qatar and Kuwait um, you know, having some type of strategic cooperation with Israel anytime soon. Uh, would what I do would it change at all if Saudi Arabia came in in a more uh, formal way? I know the Saudis are already informally talking to the Israelis. Yeah, I, I, for those countries, not necessarily. Um, I think they'll have to come to it when they when they come to it. Um, but uh, so I think you're looking at you know, some of uh, the bilateral, multilateral um, cooperation that doesn't quite, you know, meet the threshold of, of all of CENTCOM, like, um, like the coalition village uh, that we had in the, in the you know, after 9-11 in, in, in Tampa. Um, I think you can, can see uh, developing uh, cooperation. I think actually it would be helpful if it went beyond um, just defensive cooperation. I think um, these states could cooperate in all kinds of ways to push back on um, Iranian, um, you know, regional destabilization. They can work together on cyber. They can work together uh, on other types of, um, of, um, of economic and, and sanctions issues. Or, uh, I think that there's a lot of room for cooperation, but I think it's you know, it's not, you're not going to get everybody involved. I think, uh, you know, we're not quite there yet. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that listing the Houthis on the terror designated list was a problem for some people because they were looking at uh, humanitarian aid and the problems for the civilians that would be engendered by doing that. It appears to me, and you've got experience with Lebanon as well and with Palestinians as well, that sometimes the provision of humanitarian aid prolongs the war instead of shortening the war. So if the Houthis know, or Hezbollah knows, because now we're trying to get gas into Lebanon, the US is trying to maneuver the, a, a gas pipeline that will let Hezbollah have gas, that if, if the terrorists know that their civilians will be taken care of, if the terrorists understand that they don't have to pay that price, they're more inclined to keep going so was that part of the thinking in the United States? I'm, I'm worried about um, humanitarian aid people who are in fact having the opposite impact of the one they want to have. Well, I, listen, I, a couple 
things, Shoshana. I think one is I don't think the Houthis have any regard for the Yemeni people. I think they could care less whether the Yemeni people starve. So I don't think this is going to be a, a driving factor for them. Um, uh, at times, they profiteered. At one point during the, the Trump administration, we, we stopped humanitarian, humanitarian aid um, to, uh, to Yemen because uh, the Houthis weren't allowing um, the World Food Program to do metrics to, see, to, to measure who was getting um, the, the humanitarian support. Um, they were profiteering off of it. Um, we stopped it for a couple months and we went back. Um, things really didn't get a whole lot better. But once again, I, you're looking at what, 70, 80% of the, the population dependent on it. And, uh, and uh, the Houthis who just don't care because they believe for one reason or another that with Iranian support, they can win militarily. The, the other issue I think of debate and my, my friend uh, and colleague here, Kate Bauer just wrote a smart paper. I think she published it on Friday um, on, um, on what to do about the Houthis. She was sort of ambivalent because the designation provides moral clarity. And, and the idea is that, um, is that what the Houthis want is what, um, what the Taliban wants. They want international recognition. They want uh, to sit at the UN. They want uh, um, all the, the trappings of being uh, you know, a government uh, with all the recognition that comes with it. Um, and uh, the designation, designation essentially denies them that. But, um, but whether you get any more, whether, you, uh, whether it has more of a punitive impact than targeted sanctions against individual Houthi leaders, businessmen that support uh, networks, et cetera, money changers, financiers, um, it's not clear to me. Um, that the debt because the Houthis don't have bank accounts essentially that we can get at. Um, so I, I don't know if it's more effective, but I think you know it's it's useful and, and uh, I supported it. But um, you know it's fifty. It's, it's unclear to me how much more you get out of it. Okay. Um, but I, but I think by the way, by the way, I think by the way, we it was our belief that we were able to mitigate. Um, the potential humanitarian um, impact um, that a designation would cause um, or might cause. Um, I, I, we were of the mind that humanitarian organizations are, have never been uh, prosecuted by the U.S. Department of Justice for inadvertent leakage uh, while operating in, in countries with terrorist organizations. Um, you know uh, that uh, banks could be somehow assured. That there wouldn't be this kind of chilling effect of the kind there is against doing business with Iran, for example. Um, we thought we could have we could have fixed that. So, do you want to give us your website so that if people want to go and see your colleague's paper, give us her name again and give us your website and um, yeah, her, go look her, right. Yeah, her name's Kate Bauer, B A U E R. Um, uh, she's former Department of, of Treasury um, at the Shea in the Emirates. She was there for a couple of years, and uh, our website's www.washingtoninstituteoneword.org. Great, thank you. So the United States, back to business. Um, so the United States has a naval base in Djibouti, just opposite uh, Yemen, and the Chinese have a naval base in Djibouti, just north of ours. Do we see Chinese interference in any of this, or are they just watching and listening? Uh, yeah, well, you know, the Chinese have that base because I believe Djibouti, you know, borrowed money from the Chinese. And when you can't pay, you get a hundred year, you know, free lease. Um, and they're doing that all over the, the region. Um, ask our friends in Jordan who have their own Chinese debt trap, unfortunately. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I've not seen um, interference um, or them playing a role, negative or positive. Um, in, uh, in Yemen, um, you know, uh, they were part um, during the Obama administration of, a, of a, a counter piracy um, uh, a mission that we were involved in. And we, uh, for some reason, um, the administration invited them to participate 
um, helping them to develop logistical skills and, you know, to be a, a blue water Navy, um, okay. I, it's incredible. Um, but uh, so they have a number of bases throughout um, the region, including one the Wall Street Journal mentioned would be a military base in the United Arab Emirates. Um, you know, it's expensive to protect power, but uh, obviously they have some, some ambitions in the region, but I'm not seeing um, that type of interference or, or problematic behavior so far vis-a-vis uh, -vis Yemen. So they're just, maybe they're just sitting and waiting. You mentioned, um, we're gonna come to the end of this, but I have sort of two questions. You mentioned that the Biden administration, um, in order to make its point on human rights in Saudi Arabia, had what we re we removed some air defense capabilities. We did some things to them. Well, Are we yeah, still doing to, it? To be fair, um, you know. Please be fair. Yeah, um, you know, these are uh, um, during the Trump administration. Um, you know, I probably spent twenty five percent of my time uh, at the State Department working on China related issues in, in the Middle East. Um, there was a, an enormous focus uh, from Secretary Pompeo uh, on China, and it wasn't just um, you know the origin of the pandemic, and the cover up, and et cetera. Um, but uh, it was you know looking at China as you know the, the global challenge of the next generation for the United States, a uh, strategic competitor, and I think they you know really did uh, a great service to our nation in reorienting. Um, uh, you know, our policy toward uh, meeting that challenge, uh, whether you want to call it the so-called pivot to Asia or the reallocation of resources. Um, but patriots, U.S. patriots, are in short supply. Um, you know, even during the Trump administration at one point, we removed some equipment from Saudi Arabia because you can't leave that stuff in the field every, you know, all the time. Uh, things have to be refurbished. They have to come back. They have to rotate. Um, and there are other countries where they need them as well. So you can only imagine what you know Taiwan is thinking these days with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, so I, I think you know the Biden administration, like every administration, looks at resources. Saudis have a lot of resources on their own. They're not the only people that are being targeted. We helped improve their capabilities, um, but um, you know, we will remain in the Middle East. We are remaining in the Middle East. Um, but maybe some of our resources have to go somewhere else. Uh, so I, just to be fair, just to be fair, but um, they said they were going to cut all kinds of weapons being sold to Saudi. Uh, I think we've seen very little of that ultimately happen. I think uh, just like Egypt, um, you know, where they talked a lot about human rights. Um, I, I think this policy is, you know, uh, certainly there's an optics. There are optics. Uh, President Biden, I don't believe, called. Um, King Salman uh, until he needed him to, uh, you know, release more barrels of oil, um, which is only, you know, a year into the presidency. Um, you know, uh, Jake Sullivan refused to have a photo taken with Mohammed bin Salman the last time he was in Saudi Arabia. These, you know, these aren't great, but I think the policy, the, the focus or alleged focus on human rights in the Biden administration compared to, say, the, the Trump administration, I think it's it's largely rhetorical. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the program. And for people who listen periodically or listen often, I'd like to end with a question to which you will have a positive answer. So I don't know how to make one right now because this is not a positive situation. This looks like an ongoing grinding and possibly evolving in a negative manner, a small war that could become a big war. So my question to you, David Schenker, as we close, do you see any positive signs for um, things that should make us feel better about the defense and growth potential in the Persian Gulf and Red Sea areas that will work for us? Yeah, I think that you're seeing um, a little bit more burden sharing. I mean, uh, okay, there's positives and positive, certainly positives and negatives, you know, um, but I think there's a little bit more burden sharing. I like that uh, a lot of our partners are starting to do things on their own. Now, the United States is not just a guarantor of, um, of Gulf security, but uh, that the Emirates actually periodically deployed somewhere that 
the Emirates and the Saudis thought it was important enough not to lose the war militarily in Yemen that they, you know, re-upped an effort that blunted the, the Houthi offensive and once again put this into stalemate. Um, you know, you need to have a stalemate um, or a reversal of tides on the ground for the Houthis to accept the negotiation. The Houthis are not going anywhere. Um, they are going to be with Iranian support, a major player in the Yemeni government. Uh, the question is whether that government will continue to be firing missiles into partners and major non-NATO allies of the United States. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, burgeoning cooperation, um, whether it's with the UAE, Bahrain, um, uh, and eventually uh, what I see is entirely likely being uh, more and more with Saudi Arabia, um, is a positive sign for the securities of, of all these countries. Um, so, uh, you know, mixed bag. But, um, you know, if you have to find something optimistic, I think the, the talk about, uh, about uh, the, the anti-missile, um, you know, uh, technology cooperation, um, that, that uh, countries are starting to talk about this a little bit more openly, I think that's a, a real positive sign. I'll take that as a positive answer. I accept. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of our program with David Schenker. David, thank you very much. I think I learned a lot. I know our listeners learned a lot. Um, next week, we're going to Central Europe, specifically Hungary, but not only Hungary. Please join us next week for a, a conversation with Josh Hammer, opinion editor of Newsweek. Thank you all for joining us. And David, again, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you.